Hello there, and welcome to Deeply Rooted. I'm your host, Robin Norgren, and I'm so glad that you've joined me today. You know, we're just um, people that are trying to walk more meaningful, more mindful in the world, trying to be those spiritual beings, trying to live more fully in our human experiences. And I am so glad that you've decided to come along on the journey with me. Journey. Harriet Tubman is quoted as saying, every great dream begins with a dreamer. Always remember, you have within you the strength, the patience, and the passion to reach for the stars to change the world. Harriet Tubman said that. When is the last time something you were doing in your life resonated with you as truly reaching for the stars? And what about it caused you to feel like you could really succeed? What fears did you have to let go of in order to move forward. I know for myself, I have been on this creative road for, I guess it's coming up on 15 years now. And about 10 years ago, I started a creative business that has evolved as we've moved and transitioned uh, along with my husband's career in the military. And every time I wanted to just give up on this idea, something inside me would nudge me to just do a little bit, just a little bit towards that dream. And over the last couple days, I've been going through my old hard drives and looking at just how much content I have developed and created and um, sold, you know, workshops and in classes and, you know, just curriculum online. And it is astonishing how if you just do a little bit every day, it really does have an exponential effect in that I create much quicker. I don't need to have the creature comforts that I used to feel like I needed to set the mood. And it is really ingrained and defined that these are the things that I'm very passionate about in my life. And this is part of why the podcast is uh, is here in, in the form it's in now. Because I am passionate about my relationship with God and creativity as a tool to connect not only to God, but with myself and others. Montessori, while it seems like not in the same vein, is very much like part of the process in that in that same way as a teacher where I would follow a child and follow their interests in a classroom I actually do and implement that same thing for myself and for those around me so when I work with people and when they decide they need to transition or I decide I need to transition there's a freedom there because really that's what it's all about that freedom to learn, grow, go, you know? But most of all, this deciding every day to really understand this life that I've, that I've been given, the meaning behind it and the way it changes and morphs and, and how I do when that happens. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. So I invite you today to think about that 
about that question. The last time you were doing something in your life that resonated with you, with you as truly reaching for the stars. And if you haven't done something like that in a while, perhaps sit with that and really try to figure out why. Today's activity from The Art of Noticing by Rob Walker, 131 Ways to Spark Creativity, Find Inspiration, and Discover Joy in the Everyday, is called Tune into Objects That Could Be Art. In a somewhat infamous incident in 2016, a prankster left a pair of glasses on the floor of a San Francisco Museum of Modern Art gallery where it was soon surrounded by picture-taking patrons believing the spectacles to be an artwork. This kind of thing has happened repeatedly. Why? Museums are a specialized context, the writer Tom Vanderbilt has pointed out, and have been called a way of seeing, perhaps even a training ground for looking at the wider world. This, he suggests, helps explain why a fixture or a fire extinguisher can be mistaken for art. In short, we're primed to see art in museums, so everything looks like art. Perceive these places for what they are, and you'll perceive what's in them even more clearly. My, my wife and I were once wandering through a contemporary art museum where we entered a small gallery that contained nothing but two huge wooden crates. I puzzled over them because I wasn't sure if these crates were full of art waiting to be unpacked or if they themselves were art. And idiotically, I searched for clues, either a little placard on the wall with the relevant name and provenance data. It's art or some kind of practical shipping sticker on the crates themselves, it contains art. Unable to find conclusive evidence either way, we talked it over and decided to resolve the matter by way of our own declaration. These crates were art. This was a silly attempt to make each other laugh, but it made us think of Marshall Ducamp and the urinal he signed and submitted to the Society of Independent Artists. The piece might have been his most famous and lasting provocation. Duchamp repurposed existing words and images and with a simple gesture withdrew a boundary, redrew a boundary between the everyday and the elevated. Art is what I say it is. Think then of some regular walk or drive or ride you experience often or even that you're experiencing for the first time. Imagine yourself a curator. Decide what, among the things you notice, you might declare to be public works of art. Perhaps a disheveled pylon marking a street flaw that ought to have been fixed by now. Maybe a post that seems to be lingering a lingering remnant of an otherwise departed fence. Possibly even a child with a piercing stare. Grant yourself the superpower of making art wherever you go and see how that changes what you perceive. Art is everywhere, if you say so. So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. 
Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Here's some wise words from a book by Mona Brooks called Drawing with Children and the subtitle, A Creative Method for Adult Beginners Too. Here's your thoughts on the topic, giving the artist in you permission to unfold. Here are some suggestions on how to let the artist in you come out. Number one. Listen for your silent critic and retrain it. When you find yourself getting negative ideas about your abilities, don't judge yourself. Just notice it and insert the new information you have just learned about your, new, your real potential. And she's referring back to our previous podcast where we went over the eight myths about drawing. Number two, know that you can be your own teacher or learn something with your students. And that is something that I have very much learned. (laughs) It is actually kind of funny to me that I am looking at uh, students as young as kindergarten who have incredible skill. And um, you know what? They never are critical with me or am I with them. And um, and that really, um, really taught me a lesson because... As I've mentioned before, I am usually up at the board demonstrating what it is that I want them to do. And sometimes I look at what I put on the board and I'm, I'm pretty sure it doesn't even look like it, what it is that it's supposed to look like. <laughs> but can I tell you that in, in three years of teaching, not one child has ever critiqued or said anything about what I am doing. Um, and you know, some of that is, um, kids can be kind, but many of us know as teachers, not that kind. (laughs) So it's just a reminder to me that it, if you say that's what it is that you're drawing, then that's what you're drawing. And there really is no harshness to it until we get into the realms where people become very competitive and then feel like they need to tear, tear each other down in order to, um, build themselves up, which, you know, I'm never a fan of. Okay. Number three, remember, remember that there is no wrong way to draw. If it is the way you want it, it is perfect. And if it isn't, you can change it or start over without feeling it's a failure. Next one. You don't need to feel guilty about using other visual data. Professional artists don't draw directly from their imagination either. This one my friends, is a big one to really take in. I had an incident, you know, around here, around this time that I'm uh, creating this podcast. Um, It's Christmas time. And so I don't know if I've mentioned that my husband is a, is a, in, in his spare time, he doesn't do it so much, but he's a fine artist. Um, He can see something and, and draw it. Um, yeah, so he's, he's very, very good. So that's always been something I've had to like release because I do not draw or create in that way. But anyway, he um, came up with this idea that we were going to paint ornaments. So he got these, those clear bulbs so that you can just like free draw something on it. Uh, yeah, I ended up drawing Christmas trees, painting Christmas trees on it because I am not, I, I need at least two or three things to look at. And then from there I can be inspired by it. But I, I'm, it's very rare that I can just sit down and just straight away draw something without looking at something else. And I've definitely instill, instilled that in the um, artists in my classrooms um, that they have um, always, they always have access to uh, pictures of all sorts for them to draw from, be inspired by, and even simply if they just want to see, you know, draw what they see. It, to me, um, the, the 
benefits of being creative far outweigh anything that anyone is putting on a piece of paper. It, it really, I full, fully believe that. So there you have it. We are back with the series um, from Henry Nouwen's book, Spiritual Direction, titled, What is Prayer? And today, I'm going to read an essay called, A Prayer as Conversation. When monologue moves to dialogue, prayer becomes a simple, intimate conversation with the Lord who loves us. For example, when I pray the psalm, when I call, answer me, O God of justice. From anguish, release me and have mercy and heal me. Sometimes I hear God answer, I am with you and all shall be well. Sometimes in the night I pray, O God, come to my assistance. O Lord, make haste to help me. And I hear God answer, God is for us a refuge and strength, a helper close at hand in time of distress. And when I tell God how lonely and unloved I feel, I often sense God's reassurance. Strong is his love for us. He is faithful forever. After I pray, I learn to listen to God's voice and to keep the word I hear in me, with me, throughout the day. Mediated through the word, prayer becomes spiritual conversation with the one who knows and loves me. To pray unceasingly, as St. Paul asks us to do, would be completely impossible if it meant to think constantly about or speak continuously to God. To pray unceasingly does not mean to think about God in contrast to thinking about other things or to talk to God instead of talking to other people. Rather, it means to think, speak, and live in the presence of God. Although it is important and even indispensable for the spiritual life to set apart time for God and God alone, prayer can only become unceasing prayer when all our thoughts, beautiful or ugly, high or low, proud or shameful, sorrowful or joyful, can be thought and expressed in the presence of God. Thus, converting our unceasing thinking into unceasing prayer moves us from a self-centered dialogue, excuse me, self-centered monologue to a self-centered dialogue. It requires that we turn all our thoughts into conversation. The main question, therefore, is not so much what we think, but to whom we present our thoughts. It is not hard to see how a real change takes place in our daily life when we find the courage to keep our thoughts to ourselves no longer, but to speak them out, confess them, share them, and bring them into conversation. As soon as an embarrassing or exhilarating idea is taken out of its isolation and brought into a relationship with God or with another person, something new happens. Once we take the risk and experience acceptance, our thoughts themselves receive a new quality and are transformed into prayer. Prayer, therefore, is not introspection. It does not look inward, but outward. Introspection easily can entangle us in the labyrinth of inward-looking analysis of our own ideas, feelings, and mental processes, and can lead to paralyzing worries, self-absorption, and despair. Prayer is an uh, outward, careful attentiveness to the one who invites us to an unceasing conversation. Prayer is the presentation of all thoughts, 
reflective thoughts, as well as daydreams and nightmares. To our loving Father who can see them and respond to them with divine compassion. Prayer is the joyful affirmation that God knows our minds and hearts without anything being hidden. It is saying with the psalmist, O Lord, you search me and you know me. You know my resting and my rising. You discern discern my purpose from afar. You mark when mark when I lie down or when I walk. All my ways are open to you. Before ever a word is on my tongue, you know it, O Lord, through and through. Psalm 138, 1-4 Well, I know for me, these words are so comforting to me. Because we can sometimes get caught up in this notion that maybe we're not praying enough. But putting prayer in the context of it being relationship. And not just relationship with God, but relationship with God through others. It can start to open up that idea that there really is a way that we can pray. Not in this worried and anxious way, but just as easily as we breathe. And so I hope you would continue to join me as we continue to explore what it means to have prayer in one's everyday life in a way that makes sense, but also fills you with peace.